Um, so in the meantime, yeah, we're on here talking about alternative training options. And the first one we wanted to chat about a little bit was the upcoming workshop called Big Brain Toolbox. So Big Brain Toolbox is a online workshop. It's starting Wednesday the, I have to see one, Wednesday the 15th, the Big Brain Toolbox. Um, and what this workshop is, is an online focus workshop. Big Brain Toolbox is an online class um, and I kind of designed it around those people who were really struggling in the group class environment. So this class is definitely not a class that is a substitute for group classes. There is no substitute for group classes. We know those are a great opportunity for us to work off distractions. However, um, Big Brain Toolbox can help those people who maybe are struggling to get focus in the group classes or even in higher levels of classes. Oh, there we are. Am I here? You are here. Okay, there we go. I was just saying how you're the, the technology. The technology is failing right now. I can't even hear. Did you, where did you start? I wasn't watching. I was talking about the Big Brain Toolbox and how it is not a substitute for group classes. How it is more of a something we do when we're struggling in group classes um for those dogs who seem to just be at the end of the leash all the time you know looking at everything but the owner the class is meant to kind of bring more focus and engagement to you as the owner and teach you how to engage with your dog in ways that they want to be engaged with okay that makes sense um so when you talk about dogs who are struggling in class i'm also thinking like dogs who need a little more confidence too, like the fearful yeah. or you know where they're they're sort of getting the socialization of being in a group class environment but that may be um part of the online learning can help them out like yeah. to, to a little bit further. yeah i love it when people do it in conjunction with the group classes because i do find that and i find that people are able to take the strategies from it and apply them as they learn them week by week um in the really distracting environment because it is challenging when you have a dog and i know that because i had that dog right i had the dog at one point that was always at the end of the leash pulling wanted to see everybody but me um and it's really frustrating so it's nice to be able to have um some strategies to pull out when that's happening to you or like you said when the dog's a little bit more fearful lacking confidence um or overwhelmed which i think we see come out in a lot of like really loud behaviors sometimes or in like, Powering in the corner, um, it can help them build that confidence. And it does have pretty detailed homework. <laughs> we know your classes have detailed homework. Yeah. So I have a question for you. Why did you name it the Big Brain Toolbox? So Big Brain was just something I was thinking of. I thought it was kind of funny, silly. Um, but the toolbox part, um, I wanted people to be able to pick and choose strategies that worked for them. So the class teaches a bunch of different strategies, um, different ways to get focused, different ways to get them engaged with you. Um, we do a lot of pattern games, um, a lot of like engage, disengage sort of games, and just kind of building on each game up every week. And I wanted people to be able to pull the strategies they found most effective with their dogs, because we know different strategies are effective for different dogs not everything is effective for everybody um and put those almost into a toolbox so that when they're struggling in group classes or on walks or you know taking their dogs into store or i use this for a lot of service dog clients as well when they're struggling they can go back and say okay this is my little toolbox what's going to work best in this scenario um because i find that's what people need right they need different strategies to work with their dog and things that are personalized to them and the big brain is just kind of to encourage people to use their big old brains and think of the things that they they've learned right to use them yeah and it gives the dogs a chance to show off their big brains too right and go hey I'm actually a smart and capable dog it's just you know we have to take the right strategy for that particular dog exactly in that and i I find with a lot of people, they kind of, they think their dog is stupid or something when their dog won't focus in the classroom. Like, I just, I just think they don't have much of a brain in there. And that's not true, as you and I know. Um, sometimes they just need ways to get to the point where they can show off their brains and show off their intelligence to their owners. And I think it's really cool 
watching dogs progress through the course, especially when they're taking group class at the same time, because you can see the relationship between owner and dog grow, which is really neat. Yeah. yeah. And so when you're thinking of like Big Brain Toolbox and other online classes that we do, who who are you saying like what kind of dog are you thinking of in your brain probably sticks right yes so, so all the strategies actually she's in all the videos for the class hi siobhan um and i am thinking of dogs like six so dogs who constantly have their noses to the ground don't seem to be able to give you any sort of acknowledgement whatsoever um because part of the big brain toolbox is showing you how to use that to your benefit okay they want to sniff let's help use that as a reinforcer for good behaviors and stuff like that. Um, I'm thinking of dogs who, like we said, are overwhelmed, uh, stressed in the class, who tend to be really loud and the owners have trouble redirecting them. Uh, this is not a substitute for like private reactive consults or behavior consults, but I find it the skills can help reactive dog owners as well, especially if they can't get to the group class environment um, because then they have their own little toolbox to pull out. Okay, dog's coming at me. What am I gonna do in this scenario? Um, and that's a big focus of the class too, is talking about what are your dog's distractions? What are we working against and how do we work off of those things? Um, we have a few, <laughs> okay, we're talking about some of the non-traditional sort of training options that are out there. So we're starting off with our online course that's coming up the Big Brain Toolbox. Um, so what exactly, like what is it? What do you do to class? in Big Brain Toolbox. So we start um, usually with chatting, depending on the week. Week one, we just kind of chat about their dogs, what they're struggling with. I ask people what their dog's distractions are so we can start to get you know a handle on those early because sometimes people don't know their dog's triggers. So they ha they'll say, you know, oh, we go outside and immediately they're just pulling everywhere and barking at everything. And then we kind of sit there and break it down a little bit more and say, oh, well, you live on a really busy street. So you're coming out the door and they're pulling everywhere and barking and everything and there's the cars constantly going by. So maybe that's the trigger. And we kind of see about that. And then subsequent weeks after week one, we look at um, how people did each week, what strategies worked for you, what strategies didn't. Then we usually move on to chatting a little bit about some of the theory behind the games because I find people use these games best when they understand why we're doing certain things. Uh, and then there's typically a practice portion that lasts uh, 30 to 45 minutes where you're actually working with your dog on all of the skills for the, the coming week. Okay. And it's on Zoom, so you're like watching them, you're giving them feedback. Right? Yeah. The description, we want the camera on. <laughs> exactly. It. Yeah. Some people have previously not turned it on, but that's just to their detriment, right? You have to, if I can't see you, I can't give you feedback. Um, and you don't know if you're doing this stuff right. Yes. Yeah. Um, more effective if people turn their cameras on. Um, and then we usually go through the homework towards the end of class and it is a commitment. So that's what I tell people off the bat, right? You have to commit the five weeks to your dog to doing that. I think it's 15 minutes a day of homework plus their walk, um, which really in the grand scheme of things isn't that much. And I tell people take that out of the dog's walk if you need to, right? Those little training times, um, if you really are that strapped for time. But making that commitment for those five weeks, especially before Christmas time where we know people are going to kind of start to slip a little bit and get a little bit busy, um, I think is really helpful for their dogs. And I think they're doing their dogs a service when they do that. Okay. And then also like when we're thinking, okay, it's big brain toolbox or online class, like there's some people who think it's just not very personal, you know? And when we did online classes back when we had to, yeah. right. One of the things that people were like, wow, like I really didn't think, like I thought it would just be you talking head sort of thing and not actually working through those pieces. Yeah. So I like that, like you explain why you're going to do it and you give them practice time and you watch and you give feedback. Exactly. And it is quite personalized because we sit there, you know, for that little bit at the start every week and say, how did it go? Right. Talking about your dog specifically for everybody's little bit of time. Um, so we can actually work through things. And of course, we're always available via email and stuff for questions. Um, as usual a follow-up question in <laughs> the description for big brain toolbox like the full title i believe it says for focus and motivation yes so how do the games in the class the training skills that they're going to get turn into a more focused and like a dog who's more motivated to work so, so 
the focus and motivation I find kind of go hand in hand with it um, because I did design this class also for dogs who aren't food motivated. Um, and I say that in quotations because a lot of the times it's not the case that they don't want the food. It's just the case of there's so much else going on in the environment that the food isn't interesting or they just physically can't do it. So we focus on, you know, taking that eating, which is a behavior and teaching them how to do that via the games and then taking that into those more distracting environments. And we walk people through step by step. Okay, how do we take these behaviors, this focus we have inside the house, because most people have that already. And how do we work that outside the house? And we systematically increase the distraction level for them. In terms of motivation, which is another part of it, I find the games provide motivation to work with you, right? Because the dog's having fun, we're being clear with expectations, um, and, and the dogs can figure out the patterns really fast. So they're a little bit more excited to work with you. And we're also teaching you different games to kind of get your dog engaged, but also how to kind of back off and give them the space they need to just relax and sniff and do be dogs, right? which also we know brings more motivation to work with you because then their needs are met. Yeah, exactly. And so I think um, like when you're in the class, like you're going to work on thinking some pattern games, like some control on leash stuff. Mm -hmm. Be working on like what kind of skills, like loose leash walking, or do you go into specific things? We do. I usually tell people to start a class. It's not a class where we sit and go, okay, let's do sit down, stand, all that stuff. What we do, um, some of the things are looking at the dog's skills that they have already. So are they really good at hand targets or sits or downs and developing like a routine of say five behaviors that the dog knows really well that they can perform everywhere. Um, I forgot the question. <laughs> Basically just what kind of exercises are in the class. Okay. okay. Um, so we develop those really strong behaviors. We do some games involving search cues. So generally we do a little bit of scent work, but also up down game. Uh, which is a popular control and leash games. I have a whole kind of group of, what I guess, exercises I'll call that I call the attention grabbers. So training some sort of cue that when your dog is staring at a distraction, you're finding it hard and you don't want to recall them. How are we going to get that attention back? Or, you know, they didn't listen to their recall. It's a word that we can kind of get their attention back with. Um, it does work on recall because we work name game and kind of the progressions of different recall games. Mm -hmm because again, a focused dog should all be able to recall. Um, I'm trying to think what else. Loose leash walking definitely too, because we're teaching the dogs to kind of pay attention to you throughout their life, right? And that's how I define focus a little bit, is your dog's ability to pay attention to you while also doing what they want. So if I'm walking and my dog's doing her sniffing or whatever and I stop, she should at least have enough awareness of me that she's kind of turning around looking for me, doing something to acknowledge that, hey, we're not moving forward anymore. What's going on, right? Yeah, and I think of that too. I call it like just being on, on their radar, basically. Yeah. Like when I think agility, we have like handler focus, right? Like what exactly. they're focused on you, and then we have obstacle focus. We need the dog to do the thing. Yes. So, like I could see how that would apply to different kinds of training too, not just obedience, but also in some of the Exactly. Spots. So again, the course is not just for those really distracted dogs, it's also for dogs who want to do more challenging things. Maybe they want to do some sort of sport trial, maybe agility trials or something. And how do we get the focus from them? How do we build a toolbox for those more challenging environments where we need high levels of performance? Yeah. And I see that in a lot of like the young up and coming, like I think agility, obviously, because I do agility, we teach agility. Um, but when I see like my clients who are up and coming, one of the things that they struggle with a lot of the time is that focus switch between the handler and the obstacles yeah. that they're sort of keeping everything on their radar at the same time. And that's a lot. Yeah, exactly. Especially for younger dogs. So this class definitely helps you develop even that relationship to focus on you um, in those, those spots for sure. Okay. Yeah. So I think like with big brain toolbox, that's, one of the things that you're offering that um, is maybe I was calling it like untraditional just saying like it's not like when people think oh I got a dog I have to go to a group class and I yeah. have to, you know there's yeah. a right and a wrong way to do things so an online class as a, a sort of supplement to that or yeah. even if you're feeling confident enough to go to a group class before you class sort of thing a little bit more management before you attend that environment, right? Just something you can do in the meantime, 
Or yeah. if you just let their brains engage once a week, but you can't find the time to come to classes or you live out far or something as winter happens. Um, it's a different option, right, for people, but it's not a substitution for group class because we know working in those distracting environments is really beneficial if we're making the dog, you know, setting them up for success. Yeah, I think like it, would, I guess what it would be is it would sort of complement the style of group class that we're used yeah. to, right? So, um, I really like um, people taking branching out at the same time, actually, I found has been really a really cool transition because you see them apply the strategies a little bit more with the clicker um and i see a lot more focus come from that too yeah and then my other thought that just came to my brain was what about like age like recommend for puppies or adolescents i think for sure yes theoretically you could do these with a puppy you just have to tailor it to you know their the number of training sessions you're doing a day, their attention span, all that stuff, and make sure they're having fun. And I think I talk about that a little bit is, you know, just make sure you're having fun with it if you have a young dog. But I think ideally, like six months up is pretty good for this class. They don't need next step for it. They don't technically need beginning with basics for it. Yeah. But you do need to kind of have a little bit of an understanding of positive reinforcement training methods and a little bit about what we're doing at least. Okay. Yeah. Um, is there anything that you want to say about the big brain toolbox before we maybe go into some of the other non-traditional ways? I guess just if you're looking for a little bit more attention from your dog, you're fine. You need their nose off the ground on walks a little bit more. Uh, you want some more awareness of you and acknowledgement of your existence. Uh, sign up for big brain toolbox. It's on our website. It's uh, under focus and motivation classes, I believe. If I'm right. If you uh, or this coming Wednesday at 8 p.m. So if people are interested, go online, sign up. And it's online. It's like eight something right now. It's pitch black out. Like what else am I gonna do? Exactly. <laughs> I'm gonna bring your dog ready for all that family coming during the holidays. Give them the Christmas gift of focus. Yeah, there you go. It'll it's a gift that keeps giving now. So another thing that you and I have been talking about is um, when like we say, that's a commitment, right? It's a lot of homework. Yeah. It's a lot like any of the training that you're gonna do with a young dog or even an older dog is gonna be a commitment and you're going to have to put in the time to work on it. Yeah. So one of the things that um, you started offering, I think last year was the walk and train. Yes, I think that's almost a year ago, exactly. Maybe a little bit more than a year ago. Uh, yeah, so walk and train, another alternative two group classes although this is again something most of these options i like done in conjunction with group classes again because i just think group classes are the perfect environment to work around distractions um but yeah walk and train is a program we made for people who maybe are struggling to find the time every week to get all those you know those 20 minutes a day 15 minutes a day and with their dog doing the training or maybe people who just want a little bit of a leg up practicing the skills that they're learning in classes or who are struggling with that loose leash walking piece of things or some reactivity, anything like that. And essentially what the program is, is we do some paperwork and then I come to your house. You can be home or not home. I come take the dog for a walk. We do our skills on the walk. We work on focus or whatever you ask us to work on. We come home, we tell you what we've worked on and what you're gonna do for the week. And then we go from there and we do either five walks or 15 walk packages. Okay, so if you think of your walk and train clients, you've got a variety of different personalities and, yeah. and skills that you've been working on. Um, what would you say you've seen a lot of success with um, training through, like obviously in conjunction with the people doing their homework, but through the walk and train program? Uh, I find one big thing is over arousal. So a lot of people, want it to work on the dogs who are you know biting at the leash pulling at the leash they're kind of mouthing the owners as they're walking maybe they're doing some redirection onto the owners when they get too excited um so i see a lot of success in that one because as a trainer i know how to interrupt at the right time you know reward at the right time and kind of get those things going mm -hmm. and then i'm able to transfer that a little bit better to the owners and teach them how the timing works especially because i've had the dog understand it for a little while already so the owners being slow doesn't matter as much. Yeah. But it doesn't. <laughs> um, and which techniques work with their dog, right? So um, everything's obviously still positive reinforcement, yeah. but there's it's not a thing, right? There's a multitude of things that you can do yeah. to 
of those behaviors while they're going on. For sure. Another one I thought of a specific horse dog that you worked with was building some confidence on yeah. walks. Yes, building confidence, you know, working on putting our paws on stuff, a little bit of parkour, seeing people and dogs and just kind of accepting their existence or cars, all that sort of stuff. Because that's a big one for some of the dogs too, is just, you know, building their ability to exist in the world outside of their house on walks in new environments like Boulevard or Centennial or something like that. Um, and training them how to walk on loose leash in those environments. Exactly. And even around like their area, right? Like, um, you know, who I'm thinking of in my brain, horse dog. I yeah. think so. Um, <laughs> so for her being, you, uh, is that who? Of, of everything, right? I yeah. think go in and just like, starting sort of exposure to those things like hey like how can you learn loose leash walking if you're terrified of everything that's around you right yeah. so working confidence building has then improved the loose leash walking yeah because i'm able to take food and she's able to do some of the things that exactly yeah so training them to take food and also i find those first little steps of desensitization right with either a reactive or a fearful dog where you have to be super far away from the triggers that a lot of owners don't either want to or know how to do quite as well as we do, we're able to get past those steps a little bit more for them so that they can start working at a distance. Maybe they feel a little bit more confident working at, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Um, and lastly, your stay and train, which has been very popular. Yes. And I think, the nice thing about it is that with you, you're willing to say either, yes, I think this is a good fit or no, I don't think this is the best idea for yeah. you. And that to me, like for me, that's like, it's not just money in your pocket or we'll take your money and like, you know, <laughs> this may for your dog sort of thing. There's no guarantees, but you have an idea now of what can we work on in a stay and train situation and what's <laughs> off with maybe walk and train or privates or, you know, something that the owner has to be directly involved. Yeah. So stay and train is a program that we started. I think that one is for sure almost a year ago now. Mm -hmm. uh, and essentially the dogs are coming to stay with me in the house for either one or two week intervals. Initially, we know it's an investment um, in terms of the price of it, but it's priced according to what they get. So dogs are getting an hour of training each day. They're getting at least 45 minutes of physical activity each day. Um, and of course, lots of love and attention It is a home based stay and train. So the dogs are not in crates all day waiting for their hour outside the crate. They're here with me in the house uh, in whatever capacity they can be. So if they like dogs, they can be with us. If not, we'll find a nice quiet spot in the house where they can kind of relax along with me. Um, so it's a really kind of personalized thing and they're not just shoved in a kennel for the whole stay. They're, you know, part of the family while they're here. Um, um I think so, but Mr. is being very quiet right now. <laughs> yeah. He's being a good boy. Hey, that's the current strain, stay and train boy. Yes. So Knox has been here a few times since his initial stay and train and he is always a pleasure to have. And I was just saying the other day, he comes back 10 times better every single time that he comes. He's, um, Lots of fun, and we've worked on lots of different things with him. Yeah. So it's not just, oh, he comes for two weeks of training, and then he goes home, and he's fixed, and he's perfect, right? You've been working with... Exactly. And I think going back to your point earlier, because I digressed from that a little bit, accepting people for whom it's, you know, a fit for is a big part of that, too. So if the people aren't willing to put in the work after the stay and train, I'm not likely to take them in on this client, because... I just don't like wasting people's money like that. I don't want to take, you know, thousands of dollars and have the dog not have any follow through afterwards. We can find other options in those cases. Um, or if the dog is, you know, super anxious, I don't want to stress them out more. Let's do walk and train. Let's do whatever. Um, but in terms of what was your re most recent question? <laughs> just, just, just working with the people after to continue that training. Like you're not just and then saying good luck, you know? Exactly. So part, Part of what they pay for is on the final day we do a transfer session so you come pick up the dog I show you what we've been working on I show you the cues for everything um, how we're rewarding when we're rewarding I get people to try it I give some feedback and then they also get follow-up homework notes afterwards to kind of make sure they know what they're doing 
I also like to do, and quite a few people have done follow-up sessions. So just private training sessions where we say, okay, how's this going? Let's work a little bit more on this. This is a struggle. So, you know, maybe settling in the house or mouthing is still a little bit more of a struggle. Let's try these different strategies and, and work on those a little bit more too. Yeah. So you've had different, obviously different stay and train clients for different reasons. Yes. Some have been, you know, like you said, the jumping, the mouthing, the yeah. over all. Some of them have been um, just some general anxiety, yeah. if I recall. Okay. Um, some leash, leash stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Reactive light reactivity, I guess. Yeah, I think I've had quite a few reactivity cases, which again, I don't take every reactivity case as a stay and train because sometimes it's an issue of working with the owner. If I do take a reactivity case as a stay and train, I make sure they're well aware that we only get what, you know, what we work on, what the dog is exhibiting when they're with me, all that sort of stuff. Um, but I do find it helps with reactivity a little bit because again, my timing is, I like to think it's pretty on point in terms of redirecting the dogs and I can teach them how to redirect a little bit better to their recall cue or whatever it is. Um, so that when the owners get them back, even if the dog reactivity isn't fixed, because we know that's not really a thing, um, they're at least able to get the dog's attention back on them and continue to work on those skills. Um, leash walking, yeah, we've had a lot of that one. I find the program is pretty successful at the leash walking component, especially if we get a good two week stay, because then I have time to kind of break down the old habits that maybe were there and kind of institute new skills and kind of generalize them a little bit more. Well, we're walking around now, we're not sleeping anymore. Um, and then the other thing, confidence building, puppy stuff, we've done potty training, which is a big one for some people I know. Leash activity we talked about. I'm trying to think the one other thing. Confidence building is a big one with dogs. Uh, so I had some stay because they wanted to get the dog in the car. The dog is terrified of the car. And we can work on that as well. There's also, I have, it keeps splitting out of my mind a little bit. Oh, settling. Settling in the house is a huge one. I think most of the dogs that stay have trouble settling in the house. And people are like, I want my dog to spend more time out of the crate. But when they're out of the crate and I'm not watching them, they're just crazy. And so we work on that as well, especially with a strong mat cue. Oh, do you have a nuggy? Yeah, I have a nuggy. She's um, in her bed with her toy. But um, no, I think that, so like there's another client that you've had a few times now. And she says every time that she her dog back, she's doing better at agility. She's faster. She's like motivated. She's, you yeah. Know, but yes, like all those things. So it's. Again, it's not just the basic, like, oh, I can teach your dog to sit. Exactly. It goes beyond that. It can be used for anything like that, right? If you want us to do some agility training with the dog, we can work on that in stay and train. If that's what we're specifically working on. Otherwise, it might just be a side thing. Um, retrieve training can be a big one. People can send their dogs. I can teach or at least start the steps to teaching retrieve. Um, and we can get them there through the program. It just allows me to kind of take more control over the training and make sure that the dog has foundations to go on. Yeah, and I, th I think too, <laughs> like some of that I've seen you do, like with the greeting people and not darting out the door, and keeping yeah. those rules very consistent, um, sets them up for okay. We've been practicing this consistently for two weeks, right? Exactly. Um, and, and you know we need to keep that consistency up. Yeah, I find when you want to know if there's turn down service at bedtime, there is Chi Chi's turn down service at bedtime. <laughs> um, yeah, in terms of those skills, I find it's almost like a, sh I don't want to say a shock to the system because that makes it sound bad, but the dogs come, they're out of that typical environment where maybe they've been allowed through no fault of the owners, but allowed to mouth or they've gotten away with it a few too many times. Um, and they're in this environment now where we're kind, we're positive reinforcement, but there are rules and you know we follow through on all the cues that we give within reason um and there's a little bit more boundaries that they have to learn about so you know we don't just run out the door anymore we sit we stay like you were talking about um and again like you said practicing that for two whole weeks in a row makes it like it's a habit for the dog so that when the owners get it back if they're able to keep it up then the dog is really successful and they're able to see those things caveat to that don't keep it up the <laughs> unfortunately won't continue it's like riding a bike although i don't like that analogy because i don't yeah i don't remember how to ride a bike any skill like 
I you know I played the piano when I was a kid for like a month. I don't know how to play the piano now. Yeah. <laughs> you, yeah. you have to keep it up or, or you know how to like carry a tune a little bit. I can make some notes sound good. And if someone gave me a lesson consistently again, I probably could pick it up. But yeah, I can't play it anymore now that I've stopped practicing. Yeah. So that's the same thing with the dogs going home. They have to keep up the practice. Otherwise, they're not going to continue on with those skills. Yeah. And I think too, like with the stay and train, mm -hmm. um, when I've seen some of like, some of the things that we've done with the dogs is also that we have access to a lot of resources that we can yeah. get a lot done in a couple of weeks. Like I recall you had one who was not aggressive, but didn't really know how to play with other dogs, right? A little bit I awkward. Um, and we have access to so many dogs, right? Like we can set that up. We can, um, like I can come to the house and work knocking on the door. I've done that a bunch of times with you and your stay and train dogs. Work knocking on the door, work the greeting, work coming into the house. Like we have people who know how to do all those things. Exactly. We've got resources to pull from. Yeah. yeah. And the other thing is, you know, if I'm not sure how to train something, if I'm concerned about a dog's behavior, I have you, I've got Anne Marie, I've got our whole team that I can reach out to and chat with um, and pull kind of ideas from like, oh, this isn't working. What else can I try and figure out how to go from there? So you're definitely right. Resources are a huge part of it. And also the time, because with an hour a day of training, very few owners have that amount of time to put their dogs a day. That's invaluable, right? All that practice that they're getting in every day, working on those skills really solidifies them in their mind and helps us build a strong foundation for the owners to go home with. And yeah. When you were saying like you have, you know, you have some, um, for walk and train, you have paperwork before you go. It's the same thing with stay and train. Yeah. There's very thorough paperwork so that the same page is what, what will happen. This is what will not happen. This is, you know, everything I need from you and this is what your commitment will be. So there's no surprises. There's no, oops, I didn't, I didn't know that I was going to have to follow up, whatever. Like it's all laid out. Everything's all good. We've got all the insurance properly and everything. Um, we only take very small numbers of dogs and we don't do like crazy off leash playtime where everybody's running together and being insane. It's very safe. Dogs are not just allowed to run off leash, run amok in the neighborhood or anything like that. They're always on leashes. Um, and yeah, we try to make it the safest environment for them. We use good management practices and um, yeah, you're giving consent forms. You're telling us what you want us to work on, all sorts of good stuff like that. And you get daily updates too from me. Well, I try to make them daily, but sometimes I get busy. Um, so, so overall, like we covered a few things, but for mm -hmm. for the non-traditional ways of training, I guess what we're trying to do is just show people that there's more out there than just going to a group class once a week. Absolutely. You can do things in conjunction with um, or before, or after, whatever mm -hmm. um, group class. Um, and there's different sort of... Um, skill sets that are going to help different dogs so we've talked about this like stay and train may not be the best for dog x maybe you'd recommend walk and train instead sort yeah. of thing before stuff like recall for stay and train if that's the major thing people want to work on because that's a lot of relationship based stuff yeah don't really super recommend it for that it can work but there's better options for us to give you than the stay and train for that one yeah and i mean if they're doing a stay and train anyway it's not to say you can't work on recall exactly. but like, it may not be the bulk of it yeah um anything else you want to say about options for non-traditional training i think just if you're struggling in classes if you feel like you're really frustrated with the dog and you feel like you're you kind of every week you're dreading coming to class reach out to us let's talk about some of these alternative options because we don't want you to feel that way we want to give you different experiences to have um to kind of set you and the dog up for success in terms of stay and train, I'm going to be dropping the dates for the new year. I'm all full for this year, um, unless you have like a little bit, a really specific time you want to ask about. I'm pretty much full for this year. Um, so we're booking into the new year now for that. So I'm going to put out the new dates that people can book on for the new year tomorrow. <laughs> I have one more follow-up question now that you said that. Why, um, and I know the answer to this, but I think other people maybe. Why do you have a minimum for stay and train? Why do they have to stay for a week? So with the one or two week, I honestly prefer the two week ones, depending on what we're working on. Um, I need enough time to settle the dog into the house. I find it usually takes about three days for them to 
get comfortable in the house, you know, get motivated to work with me, build that relationship with me a little bit more. Um, and if we're doing, people are like, oh, I just want to send them to you for three days. That entire three days is just going to be the dog settling in. So we're not going to see progress. Um, however, once they are there for the two weeks or one week, I have those three days to settle them in and then we're able to get some actual work done. After the minimum though, so after you stay your one or two week stay and train, you get access to the stay and train light program, which is a reduced cost and also um, can be done for shorter stays because the dogs kind of know the rules of the house. And I know they've had the training that I need them to have to kind of live safely in my house with me. So um, yeah, the minimum amount of time just gives me enough time to make sure that we actually do make some progress on the skills that you're sending them to me for. And I'm not just wasting your money when you send them. Yeah, uh, big thing. Like when I, years ago, um, I used to do a different version of staying with the dogs with the boarding kennel. And I would go there and I'd work with the dog for time. And I did find like a lot of that for the first few sessions was just the dog being like, who are you? Yeah. Like, why, why do I care about you? Yeah. Um, and, and so, yeah, like I would get to know the dogs. Like we did, you know, different things and stuff. And I'd have the dogs that were with me for, you know, three days a week or whatever. Yeah. And I would that hour three days a week and by the end of you know that package yeah we had a great working relationship and we yeah. could get a lot but it was similar in that like if you did just one or two um the dog doesn't really care for me all that much the motivation's not there yeah. um maybe a really really food motivated lab or something like that yeah um, but i think it's important that um they realize like it's not it's not because like we want to keep your dog away from you yeah. you know like people my puppy I can't do that like yeah but if you want it to yeah. work <laughs> that time from yeah. them yeah yeah absolutely and what was I gonna say in terms of the yeah I find one week is good for dogs who have done quite a few classes who just want to build like one really specific skill so for example um, I had one who I knew from classes come to stay for a week and they just wanted a really good stay on the mat so that people could greet at the door all that stuff one week is usually fine for that sort of thing as long as I know the dog has foundations and I'm pretty familiar with them. For more serious behaviors like reactivity um, or leash walking too, I like to have that two week period to really make sure we're solidifying those skills and have time for generalization too, right? Because that's something a lot of people need with the program. Well, um, Nuggie's starting to get upset with me. For... Oh, okay. so better go do something with her. <laughs> yeah, better go do some tra yeah. training, maybe some big brain. Off. I don't know. Yeah, big brain toolbox starting Wednesday at 8 p.m. And then stay and train dates are going to come out tomorrow for the new year. So if you're interested in those, send us a message, send us an email, give us a call tomorrow, uh, and we can definitely set something up for you. Perfect. All right. We'll talk later. Alrighty. Bye, guys.